Welcome to this series of videos. In this series of videos, we're going to be talking about this new board. Well, new to me. It's not one that I've played with a lot until now. It's one of the latest generation of these smaller form factor boards like the CC3D and the Mini APM 3.1 that's about 35mm side to side with 30mm mounting holes. So now for smaller craft or smaller planes, we have an awful lot of choice now about which boards we're going to use. If you're interested in the other boards, the APM series is already on the channel, so you can go and find those. We have APM 3.1 video series for both um, multi-rotors and for planes. In this one, we're going to add this board to a small 330 class quad that's had a KK 2.0 on it. So if I show you what tends to come with a board, uh, you actually get the board itself, of course. So this is the top. And uh, what you'll find is that at the top, these six um, outputs are where you connect the motors or servos to, whatever you're going to use. Then down here on the uh, left-hand side, we have the RC inputs, where we can do CPPM pulse width modulation, or we can actually also do SBUS as well, which is good for this. We have um, the micro USB port at the bottom, and a number of tracks that you can uh, kind of break or make depending on what you want the board to do. So we, there is a little bit of soldering unless you buy a pre-soldered one. So in this kit, I got both types of connector. So I'm probably going to use the ones that come out straight to the side just to keep the overall height of the board as low as I possibly can. And we get a cable as well, which will connect to the RC outputs and allow us to easily connect them to the channels on our receiver. There are two versions of the Nazi 32 board that's currently available. Um, I'm not talking about the copies. There's lots of other copies around there that look very similar, have a slightly different name, but are basically the same thing, but always double check. There's the Funfly and the full version. The Funfly is the light version of the board. So it has the same functions and abilities as the full version, but it doesn't have the magnetometer and the pressure sensor. So the way you can think about this is that the Funfly is kind of a KK 2.0 equivalent. It can do um, auto level and um, basic multi-rotor configuration. And it's excellent at that. The full version can do all of those things, but it can also um, do a couple of extra little tricks as well. It has a three axis magnetometer, so it can do things like heading hold, and it also has a pressure sensor. So if we actually look on uh, mine, you can see this little tin can with a couple of holes in the top is actually the pressure sensor itself. And that also allows us to control height and um, altitude. Because we're, the full version has things like the three axis magnetometer, uh, the pressure sensor, as well as the axis, um, the accelerometer and gyro, you'll find that we can do things like add a GPS to it and get it to run uh, missions that makes it feel and act very similarly to things like the Multi-Wii SE 2.5 boards that some of you may be familiar with. So I would say if you already have a little bit of knowledge about boards, think of the Funfly as a KK 2.0 and think of the Multi-Wii as a um, Multi-Wii SE 2.5. Not exactly right, but it kind of gives you a handle of which is which. The next bit that can be a little bit confusing with these boards is all of the different software options because at the moment we have at least three. I'm going to talk about the three most common ones. The first is MultiWi version 2.3 or later. Because a lot of the underlying code is actually based on some of the MultiWi routines, you can actually use the MultiWi conf from version 2.3 or later of the code to actually look at and configure some of the settings on the board. But because the processor and some of the architecture of the hardware is different, you can't use this to actually create any firmware and load it onto the board in the first place. To do that, you need base flight or clean flight. The next one that you'll tend to find linked to on an awful lot of sites when you're buying this thing is the base flight configurator. Uh, originally uh, well, written by Timecop and um, very stable, mature code. Uh, has a wonderful little interface that you can go through to set everything up 
and it actually runs as a um, Google app in Chrome. So you have to have Chrome on your machine, it'll run on PC, it'll run on Mac, and uh, it's been around for a while and a very stable, great piece of software. There's a branch of Base Flight that's now being edited and developed very quickly that's called Clean Flight. Uh, now this again runs as a Google app, um, very similar to Base Flight in how you access it and how it runs, but it has a lot of additional features that are starting to come in now. So the one I'm going to use after mooching around in some recommendations from the subscribers is we're going to set this board up with Clean Flight because that's the one that is being developed the fastest and because I've already done the MultiWii 2.3 things on the channel already, um, we'll use this new interface. So the next thing we need to do then is we're going to have to fire up the old netbook, uh, start Google Chrome, and I'll show you what to do next. So here we are on my little PC uh, running Chrome, and the way we're going to get access to Clean Flight is I'm just going to type Clean Flight in the search bar, and then it'll come back and tell me at the top that um, the Clean Flight configurator is available from the Google Web Store. I click on that and then we have the option to install it. There it is. So I'm just going to click on plus free in the top right hand corner. It'll say are you sure you want to? We're going to click add and it'll install the application. Now on the desktop, we've got the Chrome App Launcher. So if I just double click that, in there is Clean Flight. So I'm just going to click on that to run the application. And there it is. It's that fast. So we can see what we're running on. Um, the next thing I'm going to do is plug the board in. I haven't done any soldering, you'll notice, or anything like that yet. The reason is, is that I want to test the board works. One of my subscribers very sensibly advised that before you do anything with this board because there is soldering involved always test it works first because suppliers tend to get a little bit unhappy if you send things back and it doesn't work um, and you've soldered things onto it so check it works first and then if it doesn't work after you've done your soldering you know you have bridged something so let me plug the board in and let's see what windows does i'm just going to move this to the side so we can see um, if anything pops up. Okay, I'm going to plug it board in now. We have lots of lights flashing on the board, which is great. It has appeared in base flight very quickly as COM22. So before we can do anything else, we can't click on any of these tabs because if we try, it says you need to connect before you can view any of the tabs. We can't connect yet because the board doesn't have an operating system. It doesn't have any software. So we need to put one on. So the very first thing we do now the board's connected is we click on firmware flasher. Then we click down and we choose the board and firmware that we want. Now the version is... Um, the first number, so 1.7, you can see these are release candidates, this isn't release software yet, so we're going to go for the last one that was stable, and you can see there's all these different, so the CC3D um, and other boards, we're going to go for 1.6 nays, and then we shall uh, click on load firmware online, which will actually use the online version, and then finally, we'll click flash firmware. Now you'll notice that the um, bits and pieces on the board, uh, the lights are all changing so now the red, green and blue lights are all on and we're starting to work. Okay. Programming successful, that looks positive. We're back to just the blue lights on the board and we can confirm that it's all working if we click on connect at the top. That looks really good. We actually can see things. If I move the board, we should be able to see the display on the screen changing as well. Fantastic. We can also see the headings changing. 
over here, which means the magnetometer is working. We can see the uh, accelerometers and gyros are working too. That is looking really, really good. So we've done the first part and we can also see at the top here that we have the gyro accelerometer, magnetometer and barometer installed on the craft, which is as it should be, it's the full version. The only two things we don't have are GPS and sonar. We'll do GPS in a later version. So now we've got to this point and we know it works, then we can start actually calibrating everything. First of all, we can calibrate the accelerometer, magnetometer and um, reset settings here. I would recommend that you do these two bits now because it's very easy while it isn't on a board. I'm just going to pop off the little bit of blue tack that was keeping this flat. I'm going to put it completely flat on the desk and click on calibrate accelerometer. That looks great. We're going to calibrate the magnetometer. Now this one we're going to have to move the multi-rotor at least 360 degrees on all axis of rotation. We have 30 seconds to do the task. So what I'm going to do when I click this button is basically just roll it in all directions. Um, I'm going to take it away from the camera just to do this so we can do it quickly. So I'm going to click on calibrate magnetometer. So here we go, we're going to just flick it round in all the different directions, you name it, we're going to twist it around in it and then hopefully by the time we have finished and we put it flat again here we go back to just the single blue light and that is the top front of the board and that is about north well actually that's about north which is pretty spot on actually so now we know that um, the two main parts of the board are working really well so I would say that this board is very happy and I'm personally um, happy that what will uh, can do next is actually get the soldering iron out and start putting the pins on the side. So for the soldering piece we have a couple of things to think about. Uh, there are three things that we need, really need to solder onto the board. Might as well do them all now while we've got the soldering out, out and we're done. There's the output ports at the top and we have two options for those. We can either have the kind of pins that sit straight up so that we plug the servo leads onto the top I don't want those, I want the ones that are at a right angle, so I can keep the uh, board as low as possible. So they're the ones we'll do there. Second lot is uh, down here for things like the um, battery voltage and other sensors as well. Again, you have an option to mount everything vertically. Uh, we're not going to do that, we're going to do the same again. I'm going to use the ones out to the side. And the way we're gonna to have to um, solder these is a little spot of solder on each of the pins as they come through the back and the last one which is a little bit trickier is the actual RC inputs um, which is this one here where it's uh, 10 pins in two rows and they go over the top and bottom of the board and we have to solder the pads on so let's get the soldering iron out and uh, we'll go around and we'll put all this on and then we need to connect the board again and just make sure that we're all still happy and that we haven't done something that we are going to regret. So let me get all the soldering kit out and we'll start. So for the soldering piece, we'll start with these little pins. Um, you're going to need a very fine tipped soldering iron for this. And I would also recommend that for these pads, you have something called a flux pen just to help the solder flow on as quickly as possible. We want to maintain the contact uh, with the board as quickly as we can just to flow it. Let me um, do one in one of these and then I'll have to turn the camera off because I just want to be careful to make sure that I don't do any bridging. So let me just zoom in. So here we are, we've done a couple of things here. I've actually popped this in a stand so that it's nice and rigid and what we're going to do is uh, we're going to solder these bits on. I'm only going to do one of the pins um, on camera and then I'll do the rest out because I'm, I'm going to have to kind of get in there and uh, 
do it as neatly as I can, but I'll do one to show you. So the way to do it is put the pin by the side of the thing you want to solder, bit to solder in, wait for it to flow between the two, and let go. And it's that quick, and that is, if it'll focus, um, a nice little joint between the two. So I'm going to go round and I'm going to finish all of those off and then we'll come back and we'll have a look at the RC inputs which I think are going to be a little bit more challenging. Okay, so once you get going you get quite a nice little rhythm going. So there's each of the soldered connections, nice and separate. And you can see the slight um, waxiness from the flux as it went on. Right, okay, so the next thing we need to do then is we need to solder the RC connector on the side. Now this one, what we really need to do is just hold it in place and then tag it with um, one bit of solder on one of the connectors and then that will hold it while we do the rest. The trick with this is that we need to dab a little bit of uh, this flux on each of these connectors that will just help it flow quickly along the pad and make a nice solid connection. So let me just set this up and I'll do the first one in camera and again then I'll finish them off um, so that we've got a nice clean board. So what I've done here is I've actually just um, supported it on a blob of blue tack. Uh, we've put some of the flux pen on each of the pads so hopefully this should flow pretty cleanly. So apologies if this is, looks horrible, but I'm doing it around the edge of the camera. So we need a little bit of solder, let it flow along. And there we are, that's the first one done. So I just need to do the rest, turn it over and finish the soldering. So let me do that and come straight back. So there they are, soldered on the top and the bottom. Bottom one's slightly better than the top, I was getting the hang of it. Uh, one thing I did do, I actually just popped on the cable uh, for the receiver bits and pieces, just to make sure that the pins didn't move. Um, what I was finding was uh, one of the pins uh, was slightly out of alignment and I had to kind of pop it back before everything set. Um, just the amount of heat that was having to be used because of the slightly bigger bits of metal. So tip is plug this in when you're doing this part on the side um, and uh, it'll just make sure that those pins stay in perfect alignment. Right, okay. The board is now looking in good shape. Um, we now have a place to plug the motors speed controllers into and to plug the RC bits and bobs into as well. So let's do that next. So there are a couple of ways that we can plug in the NERSI 32 uh, into the receiver. So you can see here that it depends on whether you've got a GPS fitted or not. Now we haven't this time so we're going to use the full set of inputs but you can see that on the top it goes the, there's no pin marking a dot one two three on the top and underneath it goes four five six seven eight the default pinouts if you're not using a gps are obviously ground five volts aileron elevator throttle rudder and then the auxiliary channels if you are using a gps receiver then you have to move throttle and rudder because pins three and four become the transmit and receive lines for the gps all makes sense the nice thing about this is that if you're going to use cppm or S bus, which are both supported by this board, then you can just plug a servo cable across the first three pins. So into the ground plus five volts and the pins that would normally go into aileron and plug that single servo cable into the S bus or CPPM out of the receiver. And that is that easy. It's very simple to do. Nice design. One of the things that I've noticed playing with this board is that normally flight controllers, when you connect them up to the um, USB cable, put five volts for the receiver out of the receiver bits and pieces. So that second pin is normally live with plus five volts. So without doing anything else, you can just have the board and the receiver powered all by the USB, and it makes it a very easy, safe way to test the receiver is set up properly. The NASI 32 is a little bit different in that the plus five volts that it's using for the USB connection and the plus five volts that it's using for everything else are slightly different. So the only way that we can get the receiver to fire up is actually to also plug in 
all of the motors as well because we need plus 5 volts coming in the top in order for it to come out the side and power the receiver. So let's plug in the motors as well before we do the next step. There's a web address www.abusemark.com slash download slash nazi32 underscore rev3.pdf I'll put the link in the description. That is the location of the latest manual that I could find. Um, it's a little bit old, it's 2013 now, we're on I think revision 5 of the board, it's changing all the time, but it gives you a good grounding and on uh, page 6 there's a much more detailed overview of the standard motor connections that we saw briefly when we looked at the clean flight configurator. So we're going to use the one called Quadcopter X Default which has the one in the lower right hand corner so we need to connect this up before we go any further. Now that comes pretty easy as well for the NASI32. There are the six connections at the top and it goes um, left pin is number six, right pin is number one, so that's pretty straightforward. And the ground is the outside pin, the signal is the one on the inside. So if it's the right angle pins like I'm using, then ground is at the bottom, signal's at the top. So all you need to do then is plug the corresponding ESC for the motor into the corresponding channel. So for example, if we're looking at the bottom right motor, which is number one, then we would plug the lead from the ESC into the output one. And then we'd get the next one, motor two, which is the top right motor, we'd plug that into output two and so on. Now we've got all that done, and here it is on my model. I've actually popped it on top of the 330 frame. Um, it's mounted on an anti-vibration mount. I always do that these days. It just uh, saves me having to use low pass filters and things to get rid of uh, unnecessary vibration. And you can see here that we have the receiver connections at the bottom and we have the motors connected at the top. But crucially, you'll notice I have removed the props. We don't want anything starting up um, with the motors or the, uh, the power system uh, as we're setting this up by accident and making a mess of wherever you're sat. So that's what we're going to do next. So let's connect this into the netbook. We'll run Clean Fright Configurator, but we'll also plug in the power so that the receiver has power, and it will also let us test the motors too. So here we are back in Clean Flight Configurator. I've connected back to the board and powered it from a LiPo battery as well. So this time, not only can we see things like the craft moving around, we can also see things like if I jump into receiver, we can also see all of the channels changing as well. So let me go through very quickly the pieces that we need to do the basics that we need to cover to make sure that we can fly the craft and then once we've done that we'll finish this video here and they've got the basics to be able to go out and try your first hover in the next video we'll go into a little bit more detail on some of the advanced features in clean fight configurator first thing we need to do is in setup is calibrate the accelerometer and the magnetometer Make sure that both of those are absolutely spot on and that when it's uh, the accelerometer level, it is level on the display and that when you've calibrated the magnetometer, have it pointing in the right direction, just check the heading, have a look on Google Maps, check where north is from your location, make sure that when it's pointing north, the heading direction becomes uh, three, well, zero degrees, like that. Okay, the next thing we need to do then is go into configuration. This is where we can set the majority of the initial setup. Uh, we obviously have Quad X, that's the one we're using on this board, but you can see here that there's a ton of other fantastic settings that we've got, including uh, stabilization for planes, flying wings, other uh, bits and pieces too. So this board is highly versatile. Although we're setting it up for a quad, you could actually set it up for your particular craft. Next thing we've got then, a couple of tick boxes up here I'll draw your attention to. This one is uh, mo like motor spin when armed on APM or multi wee motor stop command. Um, a lot of this is very similar to the multi wee code if you're familiar, familiar with that. So I'll tick that because I don't like my motors coming on 
when the craft is armed. I'm just old school like that. And this is a very small craft, so it's not going to be that far away from me. I'll be able to see the LEDs. Other thing you need to do, just make sure that the throttle uh, minimum and maximum kind of match what you would expect from your speed controller. I'm going to have mine up about 1100 and 1900. There's Simon K ESC, so that'll work. Next thing we need to do is just going down here is select the right receiver type. So a classic standard receiver with all the inputs is going to be RX parallel underscore uh, pulse width modulation and then the RX serial would be if you're going to use something like S bus so just make sure you have that one clicked if you go into receiver which is where we're going next and you find that you can't see your receiver channels this is where you probably have to come back and click it other things here like the uh, battery current monitoring which will set up in a later video uh, how we do the GPS and some other tick boxes too once you're happy with that click save and reboot PID tuning, we're not going to cover in this video. Um, auto tune is something that we will do uh, as an, its own topic. It tends to be quite a complicated subject. Receiver, so now we can see the receiver moving. So double check that all the channels move in the appropriate direction. So that's my rudder, your moves properly, throttle goes up and down properly, great. So pro my throttle goes from 1901 to 1105. Six, so that should be roughly what my throttle range is on the last screen that we saw. We have aileron, which is roll, and pitch, which is elevator, and that all seems to be good. So, the next thing we need to do is then we need to go into modes and we need to configure which modes we want for which setting. So, again, uh, if you're familiar with multi Wii, these will kind of make sense. So, very quickly. Uh, you can arm it using a switch, um, otherwise you push the stick to the lower right hand side for the throttle to arm it, same as multi Wii, same as APM, same as a lot of the other boards now, it's a pretty popular convention. Angle and horizon are kind of self level modes, barometer is used to maintain the height, magnetometer um, or mag uses the uh, onboard compass and magnetometer to maintain a heading, make sure you have no interference from your power lines otherwise that won't work very well head free head adjust that's where irrespective of how the craft is orientated on the sky it will behave as though it's always tail into you i think these are uh, crazy ways to fly your quadcopter personally i think one of the things you have to do as a pilot is just get over the fact and compensate for the fact that sometimes it's you're looking at its side and sometimes looking at its nose then you have osd software and auto tune so auto-tune is something we'll look at later, and that's how you can tune the PIDs automatically to get them a little bit closer. So let me show you how it works. Um, ang angle is one that I'll set. So you can see here that little channel value is showing where auxiliary 1 is. As I move my auxiliary 1 switch, you'll see it move through. I'm going to want angle to be way down here. So I'm going to set angle to be in this range. Actually, I'm going to set angle to be in the in the first two ranges. Actually, so the bottom and middle position um, is going to uh, to be angle, and you can uh, piggyback these. So if I th then wanted to uh, have barometer, so now at the bottom range, um, I just have angle. In the mid range, I have barometer and angle turned on. So that's the way it works. Next couple we need to have a look at. Uh, GPS we'll look at in a separate video. Motors, there's some really cute thing in here that lets us test that we've connected the motors properly and they're turning the right way. You get a little picture of how it should be connected and by clicking check, make sure that you have no props on the model when you do this, I can now directly control each of the ESCs. So I'm going to control motor one which should be my lower right hand motor and it should turn clockwise so as I lift this slider you'll hear the motor start wonderful it's kicking in at about just over so I might just have to recalibrate the ECs here because it's coming on about 1147 but we'll be able to fly with this 
So that's good and you can test all of them in turn. It's a nice easy way for you to make sure that you have them all connected. Right, so once you've done all this, make sure you've saved all your settings and you're ready to go out and have your first flight. So hopefully that's been interesting for those of you that are, want to try the NASI 32. Um, it's a great little board to set up. In the next video, we'll go through some of the more advanced features, calibrating ESCs and uh, doing a bit more around configuration. So thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and happy flying.